One or two months ago, my girlfriend and I went out to our favorite bar. The drive is a tad longer than an hour to our place from the bar, primarily on a barren interstate after the first 15 minutes, save for a few rural exits and one rest stop a little over halfway home. My girlfriend was sober that night and was driving. I had a bit too much to drink and I was feeling warm and tipsy. I asked my girlfriend to make a quick stop at the rest area so I could pee. Thanks, beer. This is a normal stop for us to make if one of us has been drinking, since the rest area has its own direct exit and entrance, so it's faster than taking an actual exit into a town for a gas station. The rest area has only one road in and one road out, and is surrounded by trees to the point that you can't see the facility from the freeway. It had wooded walking trails. By the time I hopped out of the car at the rest stop, it was sometime around 3 a.m. As mentioned, this is a fairly regular stop, and until that day, the only other person that I had seen in that rest stop around that time of night was the guy who maintains it. I walk in. The vending area is empty and completely silent. I make my way over to the men's room and push it open to be immediately startled by this old man, maybe mid-60s or 70s. Standing immediately to the left of the door inside of the bathroom, he was wearing what I can only describe as an Inspector Gadget coat with slacks. I noticed that he had a cell phone in his hand when I opened the door, but it was hanging down at his side and the screen was not lit up. He stares at me, and I stare back for a split second, and then I get over it and pass him to head over to the urinals. I take the urinal closest to the sinks when I notice that he had made no indication he was going to walk out because there is basically a wall of mirrors stretched out far enough that I can watch him in the mirror while I'm at the urinal. I unzip and I keep my eyes in the mirror, but make sure not to turn my head at all. By the time I look in the mirror, his phone is up in his hand as if he were texting, but he seems to be staring at me rather than his phone. Either way, he definitely was not looking at his phone. A very long 60 seconds pass and I absolutely cannot piss with the silent guy staring back at me from the door. And then in the mirror, I notice him take a small slow step forward. I tell myself that I'm just tipsy and that I'm imagining it, to just get on with the thing and get the heck out of there. And then he takes a more obvious step forward. And I put it in my pants while I speed walk to the back handicap stall and I lock the door. I went to the back where my feet weren't visible, and I texted my girlfriend about the creepy guy inside of me. I sit and wait to hear the door open, signaling him leaving, but it still doesn't. After possibly the longest 8 minutes of my life, I hear the door open and close. I wait another 2 minutes and I finally pee, in the stall though. I crack the stall door first. Luckily, the bathroom isn't huge and I had almost complete visibility of the room from the stall that I had picked. I saw no signs of anyone else, so I walked out. I washed my hands and I beelined it back to the parking lot. I finally made it back to the car and I asked my girlfriend what car the old guy had gotten into. She turns to me wide-eyed and says, He didn't get into one. He just walked across the parking lot and went into the tree line. With the rest stop being the only thing on the very short on-off ramps and the other closest civilization being 5 miles by interstate, I don't know where that guy was going. Later I realized is although the rest area main room is small, there is a second entrance and exit on the side that goes to the patio backing up to the woods. I forgot about it because I just never use it. But if that guy had somehow managed to get a jump on me, he easily could have pulled me out of that door and my girlfriend would have never even seen it. I don't know if that was his plan, and if I ruined it when I made my dash for the stall but regardless. Old man creeping in the rest stop bathroom in the wee hours. Let's not meet again. Here in South Africa, we're in lockdown right now. I meant to travel for work to Santa Barbara, but since we're under lockdown, we can't go anywhere. So, I'm an entrepreneur with a tech startup here, and since I travel mostly, I make use of my Regus co-working space for a hot desk or a meeting room. It's quite flexible, 
and there's always coffee and pretty girls coming in and out. Since the virus broke, however, I saw Regis as a public or corporate office, with many people coming in and out. Therefore, I was now stuck with no office. A buddy of mine told me that he has an entire unused area at his house behind some offices that I would be alone in. I would have my own kitchen, lounge, TV, bathroom, etc. The catch? I would have to park on the road. So let me explain the way that the road is. It's a wide, a steepish road with a massive park and zoo on the left, with three entrances and parking and houses and businesses on the right. I use this road quite often to go to Florida Road, a popular bar and food district. There's only streetlights on the houses and businesses side, as there was a red line or no parking line alongside the road on the right and left. I had to park outside of the park. So, I parked in the first parking nearest to the building that I was working at. It wasn't near, but I still had to walk a few meters. Now getting back to it. This story takes place one night before the lockdown. I had a call with a company in Denver, Colorado, which had to start at 6pm. It went well and I decided to pack up and leave. I wore formal shoes and carried my laptop on my back. Being paranoid, before I left, I looked on the CCTV before opening the gate. I didn't see anyone outside. I then proceeded to buzz myself out, lock up and walk out. I don't know how, but in the time it took for me to walk from the building to the gate, a man appeared. He seemed drunk or high, and was just hanging around against the fence on the side of the road my car was on, wearing a hooded sweatshirt with the hoodie down torn brownish jeans and sneakers. I started walking and I looked down, keeping track of him from the corner of my eye. Mine was the only car left, so I would assume that he knew that it was mine. As I got closer to my car, I noticed him started to walk out towards me. I ignored it. He was still walking diagonally, trying to cut me off. He then said, as he was maybe five meters away, let me help you with your bag, sir. Now, I had a comfortable laptop backpack on. I was walking hands-free, and yet he asked to help me with my bag. In South Africa, car guards usually help you with your grocery bags and expect a 5 or $10 tip. But not this guy. This guy knew what he was doing, where I was going, and what I was carrying. To make matters worse, he had his left hand in his hoodie pocket and he was now walking faster. It all went down in a split second. He suddenly lunged at me, but being a football player, I feigned left and I went right. In that split second, I thought, if I ran to my car, which was still another 10 to 15 meters away, I would have surely not made it. I am fast, but fumbling with my keys, opening the door and getting in, I didn't seem confident. So I made the decision of jumping the fence into the now dark park. I made it with one leap over, albeit slower since my laptop backpack kept bouncing on my back. As soon as I hit the ground, I took my laptop bag off, held it in my hand and I ran. I looked for a dark spot to hide, so I ended up behind a massive tree in the park. There are a few of them, but it was the only one that didn't have any light hitting on it. I heard him running in, slurring his words and saying something like, Just give me the bag. So my car was on the other side of a tennis court. If I could get to the tennis court, sneak around that and run to my car, I would make it. But there was a lit open space between this tree and the tennis court, and he was running straight through that space. I watched the angle of him running, and slowly rounded the tree to keep myself out of his line of sight. I honestly think him being high helped me immensely here, as he ran straight past and towards the other side of the park. When he was a distance away, which couldn't have been more than 20 meters, I made a break for it. Not being quiet now, I pushed away every branch and leaf, which he heard and turned around and saw. I burst around the tennis court. It was stupid because I should have just went back the way that I came. I turned around and I saw him yelling and running back at me, stumbling every now and then but picking up the pace and actually gaining on me. He had a knife, and it was out now. I puffed my way up the hill, opened the car and jumped in. 
I locked the door with my laptop on my lap and I started the car. When I looked back at the darkness, he was gone. He must have slunk back into the park when I was out of range. But where? I didn't wait to find out. I skidded and I drove the heck out of there. I won't say that I won't work there again. I would. But maybe I'll Uber next time. So this happened five or six years ago. I was a bridesmaid in my cousin's wedding. This was a destination wedding in a bigger city. Therefore, the guests were staying at this one hotel. After the celebration was over and the after party at the hotel bar was over, someone suggested that we go to the casino. I agreed as this was my first time at a casino and I wasn't ready for bed yet. I remember sitting at a slot machine and beginning to play. Before I knew it, I had begun a friendly conversation with the man to my right. He wasn't much older than me, and we seemed to be having a very fun time. I mean, I know I was, and I'm pretty sure he was too. Because when I ran out of money, he put in a 20 so I didn't have to leave. I told him that he didn't have to do that, but he insisted saying that it was my first time at a casino, and that I was giving him good luck. I reluctantly said, okay, but if I win, you get the money. We sat there for a little while longer, until lights and sounds started going off. I had no idea what was happening. The man excitedly turned to me and said, You won! He excitedly shouted again, throwing his arms up, celebrating. You won! No, remember? I began to remind him. You put the money in the machine, so you won. I'm just good luck. We argued with each other for a while. He wanted me to keep the money, or I felt that I should not and it was his. Finally, I was able to at least convince him to take half. 500 for him and 500 for me. We laughed and joked around for a while. However, it was late so I decided to cash out. We split the winnings and it was around that time when I noticed that all of my friends were gone. Oh well, no big deal I thought. The hotel wasn't too far from there, so I'll just walk back to it. I said my goodbyes to the man, and I walked towards the exit, doing a last minute check to see if I had everything. Money, purse, cigarettes. Yep, that's it. I said mentally to myself, and I began to walk out of the door and towards a hill that I would have to ascend in order to get to the hotel. I began climbing this hill heading towards what I believed to be the direction of the hotel. I'm not sure what made me do it. But I turned around and I glanced down towards the casino building. Just then, I saw a black shadow figure of a man walking in the same direction as me. Okay, whatever. That's not a crime. I didn't notice any threat. It was however becoming chilly from the mid-October weather and the fact that I was in a spaghetti strap dress. As I picked up my pace, I noticed the man did the same. It was right then that I noticed out of the corner of my eye that the man began to run towards me. I took off as fast as I could towards the buildings above the hill, the whole time hearing the man's footsteps becoming faster and faster. It became scarily obvious to me now that the man was chasing after me. I took off as fast as my high-heeled strap feet would let me, but I soon noticed something terrible. I couldn't remember where the hotel was. I was lost and if that wasn't bad enough, being full-on chased by someone. I came across the building and began knocking on the doors, windows, anything I could do to attract attention and pray that someone would hear. I walked around the other side of this building, still knocking, and just then the door opened. To my surprise, someone had heard me. This building, I would soon find out, was a fire station. The police were called, and my story was told. I was given a ride to the hotel then, thankfully, that nightmare was over. Nothing ever came of that incident and I never got a really good look at the person. To this day, I still have no idea if it was the man that I was gambling with. Maybe someone at the casino who saw that I won some money and was walking alone. I would like to say that maybe it was just someone running home and meant me no harm. But honestly, the way this person was running towards me, well, you don't run towards someone like that unless you're trying to catch them. Let's start off with some backstory. 
My parents had shared custody of me until my dad wanted to start working away, so I moved in with my mom. She lived about two hours away from where I lived with my dad in a pretty crappy suburb. Plenty of junkies and alkies. I was 12 or 13 at the time, maybe younger. The man's will be Craig. Craig was my neighbor. My house was at the end of the road, and then an empty house and then Craig's house. Craig's house was about the same size as ours, but he had about 10 people living there. They were aboriginal, so it's not unusual to have so many people living in a small house. It was around 8.30pm, and one of my small dogs had gotten out of the house and ran down the road. So me, being the good fur mom that I am, I went out to look for him. I called for him a few times until I started to panic. Craig sat on in his lawn, drinking with plenty of empty bottles beside him. I was on my lawn when he stood up and stood in the center of his so the vacant house's lawn separated us. Craig waved me over, telling me to come closer, so I did. I walked closer. He told me that he had my small dog in his yard, and if I didn't hurry up, he was going to get rid of the mongrel and hang it all over my house. I was in shock, so I walked closer. And then one of the women that I lived with came running out and told me to get away from the man. I snapped out of it and basically ran inside of my house. What happened was, my dog had basically done a lap of the neighborhood and came up right next to our house. He dug under the fence and into the backyard. One of the other women that I lived with heard him bark so she asked the others if I was still looking for him. And that's when the lady had called for me. To the old man who told me he was going to get rid of my dog. Please stay away. This story took place a while ago, but I tried to keep all of the details exactly as I remember them. I also consulted the friend mentioned in the story for her input as well. My best friend and I have lived in the same neighborhood our entire lives. It's medium sized and painfully suburban. You know, the kind that has a whole three house style throughout the entire thing. It's also ridiculously safe, not that that is a bad thing. So our parents were never uncomfortable letting us walk our dogs or to the park or playground alone. And we didn't have cell phones. We were never uncomfortable either, as we know just about everyone. I had never felt unsafe here. Until this day when I was 11. My friend and I were walking the dog together. We decided to walk her to the park and hang out there for a while. To give you an idea of the setup, this park is downhill from the main street where the houses are. There's a long driveway going around to it from the street that is bordered on both sides by very tall and dense trees. Once you get down this driveway, it's more like a street. There is a small parking lot with tennis courts, a basketball court, and a playground. Behind the playground is a small section of woods that is a lot denser than it looks. It's easy to get lost in there if you don't already know your way through, which my friend and I do. Anyway, this park is surrounded by trees on all sides, and the only notable entrance is the long driveway, making it actually very isolated from the surrounding houses. Usually no one ever uses the small parking lot, but on this day, there was a beat up red pickup truck. It was strange, but something about the truck immediately made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I just didn't trust it. Before I could say anything to my friend, who later said that she didn't feel anything strange at first. A man's voice called out to us from the passenger side window. It was deep, gruffy, and oddly slurred. He tried to call us over and his friend, the driver, also joined in. They said that they wanted directions and could we pretty young girls help them out. My friend started to walk over, and as she did, the first man got out of the truck. He was much bigger than either of us, and clearly drunk even to two preteens. My friend had stopped walking at this point, but that is when he lunged towards her, grabbing for her wrist or something worse. We both screamed and her dog started to bark, which threw him off enough for her to pull away and for us to start sprinting. We could hear them yelling and cursing behind us, but I'm not sure they were sober enough to even really walk, let alone chase after us through the woods that we had just entered. You remember how I said you have to know these woods to be able to get through them? Well, living in plain in that neighborhood our entire lives paid off that day because we were able to lose them. 
We got away safely, and once we made it back to her house, breathless and sobbing, we told her parents. They called the police, but by the time they made it to the park, the truck and the men were gone. As far as I know, they were never found and nothing ever came of it. We were safe and our lives went back to normal. Still, even while sitting here writing this years later, the memory of that man's voice sends shivers up my spine.